Hello and welcome. Now in this lesson I'll be trying something a little bit different. Some of you guys have said it's really helpful and useful to see the grade 9 model responses for the English language paper 2 exam for Edexcel. However, what would actually be even more useful rather than you just narrating a written response that you have prepared, what would actually be even more useful for you guys as students is if I actually gave you a live demonstration of how I would answer this exam. So this is the language paper two exam for Edexcel and show you and demonstrate to you in real time how I would, my thought process when it comes to highlighting and selecting keywords, how I would approach all seven questions, including 7a and 7b in section A, and of course, how I would approach the transactional writing exercise in section B, okay? Now, this paper is a huge paper in the sense that it's much longer in terms of time than paper one, okay? So whilst with Edexcel English Language paper one, you've got one hour, 45 minutes. For this one, it's two hours and 15 minutes, okay? So you have to really pace yourself throughout this exam. On top of that, unlike English language paper one, where you have just one extract, and this is a fictional extract you're presented with, for language paper two, this is a non-fiction set of extracts, okay? So you've got two extracts you have to work with. And on top of that, for section B, you have to produce a non-fiction style of article, okay? So either a letter, newspaper, a guide, and so on, okay? So there's a lot that you are demanded of. And the final thing, Unlike language paper one, where you have just four questions in section A, for language paper two, you have a total of seven questions. To be honest, it's eight questions, okay, because you've got seven A and seven B to deal with. So there's lots of shifting pieces, okay, and of course then you then have questions eight and nine, which you select, uh, question from for the transactional writing, okay? So you have a choice and then you have to pick out which question you're gonna go for. So there's a lot going on and a lot of things that you have to consider. Now, given that you have quite a bit of time that you need to work with, okay, so this is the two hours and 15 minutes, I would suggest in terms of the split in timings, for section A, allocate one hour, 15 minutes, and then for section B, allocate the remaining one hour for that section. For section A, in terms of timing, think of it as the following. 2, 2, 10, 2, 2, 10, okay, so that takes us to 6, then 12 and 20, okay? So, in terms of timings, how that works out is spend 2 minutes on question 1, 2 minutes on question 2, 10 minutes on question 3, okay, because that's worth 15 marks, then 2 minutes on question 4, 2 minutes on question 5, 10 minutes on question six, then 12 minutes on question 7A, and the remaining 20 minutes on 7B, okay? Because 7B, you have to do lots of things and you have to compare two separate texts, okay? So of course for 7A, you also have to compare it. That's a similarities and or differences question. But of course, this one is only worth six marks. Whilst for 7B, this is the big question and you have to compare both and also write an introduction and conclusion. So there's lots going on. Hence why I would suggest spending and allocating 20 minutes for 7B, okay? So remember in terms of timing for section A, 2, 2, 10, 2, 2, 10, 12, 20 for time. Now for section B, so this is the transactional writing as I mentioned, spend around 10 minutes in planning your response and the remaining 50 minutes writing out your response for the transactional writing exercise, okay? So what we're gonna be doing is looking at this particular paper, okay? So as I mentioned, you have the transactional uh, writing exercise for section B, but also you have two non-fiction texts you are presented with, okay? So this is in an insert, and of course, you then have the exam paper separately, okay? So this exam paper is fairly detailed. There's lots of pages because you have to do lots of work within those two hours, 15 minutes, and then you have the insert to work with for section A, and of course, the transactional writing exercise to work with for section B, okay? So now that we're clear on timings and what you should anticipate for the language paper two exam, what I will do is I will read through the extract with you and for each question, I will remind you and recap with you how much you should spend time on it. And then of course, you're gonna see me highlighting and working through each question and you can kind of get a sense of my thought process if I were in your shoes as a student, okay? So let's get started. So as I mentioned, you always have an insert where you have your two extracts, your two non-fiction extracts that you're presented with, and 
you of course have the exam paper. Before diving into the insert, that's always the temptation. Just go straight for reading both extracts and then jumping into answering the questions. Try to do it the other way around, whereby you read the questions first in the entire paper, highlight the relevant keywords, and then go into reading the insert. Because in this way, you can, as you're reading this insert, you're already strategically picking out the stuff that you've been asked, especially in questions one to seven, in section A, okay? Also, it's even still relevant to also see what questions you have, the options you have for section B, because you can, at the back of your mind, be marinating, considering, okay, which question option am I gonna go for in section B, and what am I going to write about, okay? So that's exactly what we're gonna do now. I'm gonna read through each of the questions, and of course, make sure you have your trusty highlighter ready so that you can highlight the keywords, okay? So let's have a look at this first question. So question number one states, from lines one to two, identify two details about the guest houses. So here we'd highlight the line numbers because that's not immediately obvious. And you're talking about two details, so I'd probably highlight just two, about guest houses. So of course, I've not yet read this, but I know that this text will include guest houses and guest houses will play an important role. Now, look at number two. From lines five to 10, and of course, obviously going back to this, questions one to three always related to text one, and then questions four to six related to text two, okay? So of course, we know that text one is gonna be talking about guest houses. However, let's go back to question number two. So it asks you from lines five to 10, so that's important to highlight because it's not immediately obvious. Give two ways, highlight just two. The writer describes people who run guest houses. So actually, I would suggest this is important, okay? So highlight describes people who run guest houses and you could use own words or quotations. All right, so that's question number two. So let's look at question number three. This question is the language and structure question. So you're being asked to analyze, talk about to what extent, and you always say that the writer successfully does this, okay? This is not a history essay, this is an English essay. You're not arguing, you're just saying, yep. And in this case, you're analyzing how language and structure is used by the writer. Remember the difference between language and structure is language is things like alliteration, metaphors, similes, verbs, nouns, and so on. Structure is sentence types, interesting punctuation such as parenthesis, which is just a fancy way of saying brackets, uh, ellipsis, repetition, and so on, okay? So you have to analyze the way the writer uses language and structure to interest and engage us as readers, okay? And you're not arguing. You are always going to say, no matter how you personally feel about what comes up in these inserts, okay? So no matter how much you might find it boring or whatever, never say, oh, the writer doesn't successfully use language and structure to make this interesting and engaging. Don't make your life harder, okay? The writer always uses language and structure to interest and engage us as readers. You're just looking for reasons and examples, okay? And let's look at these bullet points, okay? So language features and techniques, to be honest, you've already highlighted language, so you don't need to highlight that. It's it's, it's obvious, it's already indicated in this uh, term. Structural techniques, again, we've highlighted structural techniques, so you don't need to highlight that. And then effect on the reader, I would suggest highlighting effect, okay? How does that make us feel? Does it paint a vivid image? Does it make us feel tense? Whatever it is, okay? Again, we haven't read the extract, so we don't quite know the effect, but I would say this is not immediately obvious, so you highlight that as a keyword, all right? So those are the questions one to three relating to text one. So let's look at questions four to six, which relate to text two. Question four asks, from lines seven to 11, identify one complaint about the hotel rooms, okay? So now this is text two. Again, this is to do with guest houses slash hotel rooms, accommodation where people stay. So I'd also highlight the line numbers because that's not immediately obvious. And in this case, it's to do with somebody having a negative thing to say about hotel rooms. So that's question number four. Then number five, you're asked to look at lines 16 to 17, so highlight that because it's not immediately obvious. And then you're thinking about one positive comment, okay? So this is in contrast to question number four. Question number four is negative, it's a complaint. This one, positive comment to do with a hotel, okay? So that's question number five and four as well. So let's look at question number six. This question asks, in this extract, the writer attempts to show different opinions. So I would say you don't need to highlight extract because you're already looking at the extract anyway. And you don't need to write to highlight writer because again, it's obviously written by a writer. So you don't need to highlight the obvious stuff, okay? However, the non-obvious things is the writer is attempting, so it's trying using a mix of language and structure to show different opinions 
in text too. And then you have to evaluate. So that's not always immediately obvious, okay? So you'd say evaluate is a key word and how successfully this is shown. Again, this is not an argument. Just say, yep, the writer successfully shows different opinions. And then you can do, refer to language structure in terms of evaluating how successfully this is shown, okay? And in this case, to be honest, it goes without saying for a 15 marker, you have to refer to the text. But of course, if you think you might forget, just highlight reference, okay? So that's question number six. Let's now look at 7a and 7b. And these are the two questions where you have to compare both text one and text two. So 7a, which is a six marker, tells you that the two texts show opinions about places to stay. I haven't highlighted two texts because you've already been told here again that you're comparing two, okay? But both of them show opinions about places to stay. That's key. And then what similarities? This is important because sometimes the question can ask you to look at differences or sometimes it can ask you similarities and or differences. That's completely, you know, it's looking for different things depending on that, okay? So you have to highlight it. So what similarities about the places to stay, uh, do the places to stay rather, share in these extracts, okay? So what similarities is the places share? Okay, and of course you have to use evidence from both texts. I'm not gonna highlight that because I would suggest that it goes without saying. So that's 7a. Let's look at 7b. You're asked to compare how the writers of both texts present ideas and perspectives. So this is the ideas and perspectives question about staying in a guest house or hotel, okay? So this one doesn't ask you only to look at similarities and or differences. You can talk about both. Of course, also for this kind of question, you have to talk about language structure. And this question is really challenging because you're writing pill paragraphs, but within each pill paragraph, you're comparing two separate texts. Plus for this question, I know it's 14 marks, but you have to work really hard for these 14 marks. Therefore, you need to have an introduction, at least a minimum of two to three pill paragraphs. If you're going for gold, go for the fourth pill paragraphs, okay? That's obviously after you've really practiced and gotten faster, and then a conclusion. Now let's look at the bullet points. Let's see if we need to highlight anything here. So it states, you should write about ideas and perspectives. We've already highlighted ideas and perspectives, so you don't need to highlight that, how they are presented, okay? So maybe we could say, the way they're presented, okay? So that could be a key word. Again, in terms of how they're presented, you're talking about, is it presented through a language technique? Is it presented through a uh, or rather a structure technique? And then here, how are they similar or different? That's important. So highlight similar or different and then support your answer with detailed reference to the text. To be honest, detailed reference to the text, which means quoting, I would suggest that goes without saying. You don't need to highlight that, okay? So that's 7B. Let's now look at section B. So this is the transactional writing section and you always have a choice of two questions. You don't do both. You just pick one and then write about it. So question number eight states, write a letter applying for a job at a local guest house or hotel. Okay, so this is an interesting exercise. You have to write a letter when you're applying, even you could state applying for a job at a local guest house or hotel and your letter include why you want the job what relevant skills and knowledge you have, okay? I haven't highlighted guest house or hotel because we've already highlighted that here. And what difference, so I'll highlight that, you can make to the experience of guests, okay? What customer service do you have? And then any other ideas so you could add on top of that. But of course, we've highlighted these uh, elements from the bullet points because you need to address it, I would suggest allocating one paragraph for this first bullet point, another paragraph for this, another paragraph for that. So that's a letter writing exercise. And of course, don't forget, they are looking for your you to showcase your understanding of form, okay? So if you go for this question, you need to show, you know, uh, address top right hand corner of the recipient. If you want to also, again, go for gold, you can then write your own address, address of sender in the bottom left hand, and then the date, and then dear, whoever, and then you write your application and then end it with kind regards, your name and surname. So that's question number eight. Now let's look at number nine. It asks you to write an article for a newspaper. Okay, so it's a newspaper article. I would highlight those two with the title. So this is important, making the best of a bad situation. You will automatically lose points if you start off your newspaper article without this headline. Okay, so this is important. You need to use that if you're going for question number nine. Now in your article, it states you can include what you think a bad situation might be. So I would say highlight what bad situation is, okay? So you have to define what different bad situations are and then possible causes of the situation and suggestions to help people. So suggestions, so recommendations to help 
people make the best of things, okay? Uh, so suggestions in terms of if somebody is in a bad situation, the bad situations that you identify uh, in this first bullet point, how can they make the most of it or how can they even for example escape it okay so this is what you can consider at the back of your mind so now we've read all the questions and of course we've used our trusty highlighter to highlight all of the relevant keywords let's now turn to the insert okay as i mentioned you now have all of the questions marinating at the back of your mind therefore what we'll now do is read through the insert so let's begin with text one okay so this is the first non-fiction text i'm going to set the question paper to the side for now and then we'll read through again with our trusty highlighter the text one and then text two so it states extract from notes from a small island journey through britain by bill bryson now it's really important to always begin by reading the blurb okay so you're told that this is extract from your notes uh and and of course um this edited extract is written by the writer Bill Bryson. He moved around Britain documenting his experiences for his travel writing. So I would suggest highlighting uh, moved around Britain, documenting experiences for his travel writing. Okay, so he was traveling around Britain and writing about his travels. And here he's trying to decide which local guest house. Okay, so I'd highlight that. He's making the decision on which local guest house he will spend the night in. Okay, so he's figuring out which hotel or which guest house will I stay in. So that's really important. Always remember you highlight the blurb, okay? So let's begin. Further on along the front, there stood a clutch of guest houses, large and virtually indistinguishable, and a few of them had vacancy signs perched on the windows. I had eight or ten to choose from, which always puts me in mild worry because I have an unerring instinct for choosing badly, okay? So here, the first thing you could highlight is clutch of guest house. So it's telling us in terms of setting, he has lots of options and they were indistinguishable. It's really hard to tell which one is good, which one is bad. And some of them had vacancy signs. So that's important. I would highlight that. And the he states he had eight to, or 10 to choose. So I would highlight this uh, figure. And he feels a little bit panicked. It's just too much choice for him. Okay. And he's always worried that he might choose badly. Let's move on to the next two paragraphs. My wife can survey a row of guest houses and instantly identify the one run by a white-haired widow with a kindly nature and a fondness for children, snowy sheets and sparkling bathroom porcelain. Well, whereas I can generally count on choosing the one run by a guy with a grasping manner, a drooping fag and the sort of cough that makes you wonder where he puts the phlegm. So this is interesting. He's juxtaposing how his wife is really good at surveying a row of guest houses. And then he's obviously speaking in a really humorous way here. So he's talking about how he'll pick out his wife is really good at picking out a guest house where there's like a really old little lady who's really clean, very unthreatening, um, whilst he, so then he, he contrasts it with himself and he's really, he, he's basically saying he's a terrible judge of character, okay? So he's talking about a guy, so now he uses colloquial language, a guy, informal language, drooping fag, okay? A fag is a cigarette, okay? And a sort of cough that makes you wonder where uh, he puts the phlegm, okay? So this is all really humorous. Such I felt gloomily certain would be the case tonight. All the guest houses had boards out in front listing the many am amenities, colour TV, en suite, all rooms, hospitality trays, which only heightened my sense of our knees and doom. How could I possibly choose intelligently among such a range of, of options? Okay, so here I'm going to highlight the listed options. And he then asks, how could I possibly choose intelligently? So this rhetorical question shows he really does not judge. He, he, he's not a good judge of character and he really doesn't really trust himself in terms of choosing the best places to stay. One offered satellite TV and a trouser press, another boasted in special jaunty italics. Current fire certificate, something I'd never thought to ask for in a B&B. &B. Again, here we can see he's using colloquial language. And he, again, this reference to current fire certificate, this idea that, you know, it's show, this is something to show off with some of these guest houses that they, you know, they've tested that it's safe, it's not going to burn down. Again, this is supposed to be quite humorous. It was so much easier in the days when the very most you could hope for was hot and cold in all rooms, okay? So again, here he's being nostalgic, but he's using lots of humour in his writing. So let's move on. I selected a place that looked reasonable enough from the outside. Its board promised a colour TV and coffee making facilities are bought all I require these days for a lively Saturday night. But from the moment I set foot in the door and drew in the mildewy pong, mildewy pong of damp plaster and peeling wallpaper, I knew it was a bad choice, okay? So here, 
we can see that he was right to not judge himself. So the board promise, this is personification, this is interesting, color TV and coffee making facilities. That's all he was looking for. However, he then senses a pong, okay? So this is like a really strong stench of damp plaster, peeling wallpaper. Let's move on. I was about to turn and flee when the proprietor emerged from a back room and stayed my retreat with an unenthusiastic. Yes, by the way, proprietor means the owner or the person that looks after a place. So he speaks in an unenthusiastic yes, which is quite rude. A short conversation revealed that a single room with breakfast had could be had for £19.50, little short of a swindle. So this room is fairly cheap. It could be had for £19.50. However, even if it's cheap, he sees it as a swindle because he almost feels like it's theft considering the terrible quality of the place. It was entirely out of the question that I would stay the night in such a dismal place at such a lastness price. So I said, that sounds fine and signed. Well, it's hard to say no, okay? So again here, even if he's totally against it in a very British stiff upper lip fashion, he just asks the price. He then thinks, oh, this is terrible, it's terrible. But then he still goes against what he wants to do, which is run away. And he just signs in and pays the money, okay? And then he states, it's hard to say no, okay? So this is very typical British upper, stiff upper lip, kind of put up and don't be rude or anything. Let's look at this paragraph. My room was everything I expected it to be, cold and cheerless, with grubbly matted carpet and those mysterious ceiling strains, stains that bring to mind a neglected corpse in the room above. So here, this is such a great use of humour. He's saying, my room was everything I expected it to be. Usually we use this phrase to talk about an amazing surprise, okay? So obviously he's using lots of contrast. This probably, you could say, the one thing that would stand out to you about this text is its constant use of humour, which of course actually makes it quite funny. Okay, and he then uses words uh, such as cold and cheerless, these adjectives, and there's alliteration within these adjectives. Okay, and of course, he is describing this terrible, terrible room. Fingers of icy wind slipped through the single, ill fitting sash window. I drew the curtains and was not surprised they had to be pulled violently before they would budge and came nowhere near meeting in the middle. Again here, the wind is personified as having fingers of icy wind. Okay, so it slipped through. So this room is also freezing and the curtains are really old and heavy and they have to be pulled violently. So there's this really terrible imagery of this room that he's literally gonna sleep in. There was a tray of coffee things, but the cups were, let me be charitable, disgusting. And the spoon was stuck to the tray. Again here, these hyphens serve as parenthetical hyphens. Parenthesis, remember, is just brackets, okay? So he's adding parenthesis here and he's saying, okay, you know, I came in for the coffee. However, when I looked at the cups, they were just really dirty, okay? And he uses parenthesis here the, using hyphens. And this is obviously a really good structural point you can highlight uh, to show just how disgusting it is. It's really building up this terrible image. The bathroom, faintly illuminated by distant light, activated by strength, length of string, had curling floor tiles and years of accumulated muck packed into every corner and crack, okay? So again here, we're getting this really, really gross description of a place that he's going to be sleeping in, okay? So of course, he is probably panicking at this stage, but it makes this text all the more entertaining. And as we can see here, we've got three terms in the glossary that have been included. So we've got unerring, which means certain amenities, which means facilities and services and lastness, criminal-like, being stolen from, okay? So now that we've read text one, let's move on to look at text two. So as I mentioned with this text, you want to begin by reading the blurb, okay? Never skip the blurb. Don't look at the italics and think, okay, I don't need to do that. Let me just go into this. It's really important to read the blurb. So it tells us it's an extract from a great place to stay or dirty with horrible service and stale rooms. Opinions are divided over the Canada Hotel where William and Kate are set to stay by Sherelle Jacobs. So already here, we can see that this is probably a newspaper article. And the place that's in question is a Canada Hotel where the Prince and Princess of England are staying. And we learned that this article was written by Cheryl Jacobs in 2016. And in fact, actually, probably if I were to go back to text one, I probably would also highlight the name of the author, Bill Bryson, okay? Because I'm probably gonna to refer to Bryson in my answer. Let's look at the remaining blurb. This edited extract is taken from the Telegraph newspaper. So this is the Telegraph. 
uh, newspapers report on a hotel where members of the British royal family are due to stay. So this is a hotel and they are about to stay there. Okay. So the, there's lots of scrutiny as to whether probably this hotel is good enough. That's probably what I would assume before I read this extract. So let's read it. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, who are on an eight-day royal tour of Canada, are due to spend the night at a remote three-star hotel where carpeted bathrooms smell like cooking at mealtimes. Critical comments date back several years. Many of the more colourful ones have been posted as recently as the summer and September 2016. So here we learn that they are on an eight-day royal tour in Canada, so this is of course uh, Prince William and Kate, and they are in a remote three-star hotel. So also here, there's this notion of you know the status of this hotel not matching the fact that royalty is about to stay there, and of course the people who have already been really critical about it, and this notion of the comments are colourful. This is just a euphemism, a polite way of talking about really harsh comments, maybe you know comments that include swear words and just describing this really terrible, terrible place. Okay, so now it's going to tell us about how perhaps you know the reason why these guys might be staying there and of course we learned that we already know that they're on a tour of Canada or they're going to be on a tour of Canada so let's move on William and Kate have said that they are delighted to be staying at the Coast High Country Inn in Whitehorse in the wild Northwest Territory of Yukon but some TripAdvisor users have left scathing comments alleging shower curtains with handprints from former guests, dirty lavatory bowls, and the putrid stink in the bathroom, in the rooms. One previous guest described the double room they were sharing with their partner as the same size as a cabin on a cruise liner and claimed that the bed was so small that they were forced to sleep on the floor. So now here, this is where we get the colourful comments, how terrible this hotel is. And of course, this is heightening the surprise that a lot of people might have that these guys are staying at a three-star hotel. God forbid the British royal family stays at such a terrible place. So what I'll probably highlight here is the quotation here they're delighted to be staying uh, and obviously this is referring to what you know maybe the PR person or the press person has stated with William and Kate and this is in contrast to the reference to TripAdvisor so this is a very well-known website which gives uh, suggestions on hotels places to visit but also people use it to look at what other guests have to say and shower curtains with uh, handprints from former guests so there's alliteration here so these showers are really dirty Okay, so the place is horrible, putrid stink, so this is a stench. And a guest described the double room as the same size of a cabin on a cruise liner, okay? So, of course, a cabin on a cruise liner is literally like the size of the box. So, this is hyperbole here, which is describing how this hotel, there's also maybe it's hinting that there's false advertising. It's just a really bad hotel. Let's move on. The difficulties when it comes to assessing the veracity and accuracy of negative reviews on TripAdvisor have come under scrutiny in recent years. Nor is all the feedback on the Coast High Country Inn page negative. The average response seems to be one of restrained approval. Many TripAdvisor users have given the hotel three or four stars. Okay, so what this is now showing is, yeah, they have negative reviews. But can we trust TripAdvisor? So firstly, the veracity, which means the truthfulness, um, how verified it is. Actually, mm, it's coming under scrutiny. Can we really trust the reviews? And not all the feedback is negative. Actually, the average response, I'll probably highlight that, is restrained approval. Yeah, so people are begrudgingly saying, yeah, for how much I've paid and so on. This hotel, okay, so uh, the Canada Hotel, this is okay, okay. And we've got three or four stars here, which is not bad. Let's move on. One describes the staff as friendly and helpful, another praises the comfy beds and linens and advises that the restaurant is nice to relax with bed. And I'll probably highlight how the staff are depicted, what people say about the beds, and also the reference to uh, how you can relax with the bed. Let's move on. In contradiction to claims about dirtiness and poor quality staff, an especially enthusiastic patron also describes the hotel as having clean, well-portioned rooms and ex excellent courteous service for only marginally more than you would pay for a far less professional and more tired hotel. I'd probably highlight the idea of a tired hotel and excellent courteous service. So here, and this is of course a contradiction, I'll probably highlight that too. Let's move on. But it's hard to ignore the more vitriolic feedback. So this is in contrast. So now we can see the really horrible feedback. So vitriolic is like really intense, horrible criticism. 
Let's move on. The hotel used to house a YMCA hostel. One enraged guest took to the internet to brand its transformation into a hotel in the 90s as the equivalent of putting lipstick on a pig. So this is actually quite funny. Again here, there's use of humor and there's this reference to YMCA hostel. Okay, so YMCA, this uh, I guess is a brand of very cheap accommodation, usually a um, long time ago. And even today, perhaps there's a connotation of YMCA as being a place for people who are homeless, people who don't have that much money. And so people are now stating, oh, oh my gosh, how can they have turned this place where, which previously formed, uh, houses people who don't have very much money into a hotel. It's like putting lipstick on a pig. Okay. So of course, this is an interesting, um, I suppose, a uh, metaphor in terms of the way the hotel is being described and depicted. And of course, also, you can state that this is very classist in terms of how people feel about this hotel. Let's move on. William and Kate will be staying in the best room of the bunch, the premium King Jacuzzi room, which costs from £153 a night. So now here we see that, of course, they're gonna get very special service, the premium, King, uh, the premium King Jacuzzi room, and then it's £153 a night. Although this comes with a hot tub, the hotel doesn't appear to have a tarnished reputation in the bathtub stakes. One TripAdvisor user talks about a broken whirlpool. A second expresses their disbelief over missing bath plugs. So here, again, we're getting really terrible descriptions of how, even when it comes to this jacuzzi room, which is supposed to be like the most premium element of this hotel, even the jacuzzis are broken, okay? So let's move on. The jacuzzi room comes with a kitchenette, but one individual who stayed in a self-catering room has also complained about the absence of wine glasses and absolute minimum number of cutlery. So here, kitchenette means like a mini kitchen. However, of course, this mini kitchen isn't very much of a great kitchen because there's literally a minimum of a uh, number of cutlery, which means maybe you're given like one fork, one spoon and so on in a place that's supposed to be uh, self-catering, which means people can cook for themselves. So that's not going to be very useful. Let's move on. The royal couple who will stay at the hotel without the children may also struggle to get a good night's sleep. So here, this is interesting because they're gonna stay without the children. We often associate if you're childless, you're always gonna have good night's sleep. However, here we're being told that they might still not even enjoy that uh, privilege. One guest review on TripAdvisor laments that we could constantly hear a door banging. Another that rooms above the pub allowed late into the evening with music playing till 1 a.m. So here we can see uh, the banging doors, doors slamming, boom, boom, boom. And then also there's a there's some rooms which are situated right above a pub, okay? So there's also, and in this uh, pub, there's music playing at 1 a.m. And a particularly puzzled guest even retells an episode where the fire alarm went off one day for no apparent reason at all. It's a fire alarm. So let's move on to the final bit of this extract. The on-site restaurant seems slightly more popular. Health conscious Kate may nonetheless struggle with a grease smeared menu of brisket with barbecue sauce, cornbread and whipped maple bacon butter and flash fried chicken wings. That's if the food arrives. So again, here there's lots of humor and it ends with this interesting simple sentence, which of course is quite humorous. Also the hotel is, the, or rather the restaurant, so this is supposed to be the shining beacon for this hotel. It's probably not gonna fit with Kate, who is really health conscious, but now everything is grease smeared that's gonna be presented in front of her. And of course here we've got uh, a glossary of terms which are not immediately obvious. So veracity, which means truth, vitriolic, which means poisonous. YMC Hostel is a cheap temporary accommodation, usually for travelers, but it's also known for housing people who don't really have homes to stay in, okay? So, as we can see, both extracts are to do with accommodation when one is traveling. So this one is to do with guest houses when this guy is traveling across Britain and he goes to a really terrible guest house. And the second is to do with the guest house that the royal family, members of the royal family are going to be staying in. Again, there's lots of people, so they've not yet stayed there. Um, they have stated that they're really looking forward. They are delighted. However, lots of people are really puzzled and surprised. Why would they stay in this three-star uh, hotel, especially for members of the royal family? So there's also elements of classism, this idea that, you know, if they're members of the royal family, they should have a very special type of hotel. It should be five stars, seven stars, and so on, okay? So now that we have read both extracts in the insert, and of course, we'd already read the questions and we were highlighting as we're going on, or rather going through the extracts, meaning that, you know, all the relevant keywords that we've talked about, we've looked at. Let's examine how we can write a response beginning with question number one. 
So that is all for this lesson. As I mentioned, this video and these lessons are a slightly different format from before and it's actually based on your feedback, okay? So when you guys give me feedback, I'll always pay attention and where I can, I do try my best to adapt and give you guys what you need and what will help you on your journey and to make your GCSE experience, especially with English, easier, okay? So if you do enjoy this style of, les of lesson, do let me know. I'd love to hear your feedback. And of course, if these lessons are a little bit crap, also just let me know, okay? I really appreciate your honesty. I take it as constructive criticism. And as I mentioned, where I can, I'll be more than happy to adapt my method in order to really help you guys achieve that goal of getting a really solid, good English GCSE at the end of this process. So thank you so much for listening.